emissions of organic molecules. Last time we talked about ethane, and remember I said we're using the ones that we're going to be discussing as archetypes because the particular molecules that we're discussing really have broader principles. So we started with ethane, and we looked at rotation about the carbon-carbon bond and learned the, the concept of eclipsed and staggered <coughs> eclipsed and staggered structures of ethane, and we learned about human projections. We're going to continue today with the discussion of butane, and then we're going to move on to cyclohexane, which we'll continue on Monday's lecture. Now, in butane, we're going to be thinking about rotation about the central carbon-carbon bond. So let me, let me draw out butane here. Blackboard. So, okay, I've drawn butane as a zigzag structure, the same type of, of skeletal structure that we've learned to draw in the past. I want to go ahead and add some hydrogens to the structure. And so what I'm going to do is to think about, about hydrogens on there. Every carbon, of course, is tetrahedral. So that means that we have a hydrogen here on the methyl group. We also have a hydrogen coming out and a hydrogen going back. The same for the methylene group. We have a hydrogen coming out, a hydrogen coming back. Over here, as well, for the next methylene group, a hydrogen coming out and a hydrogen going back. And finally, for the methyl group, a hydrogen like so, a hydrogen coming out and a hydrogen coming back. And if you look at this structure, this is one that gives us all a staggered relationship of our HH bonds. I can, I can pop up a molecular model here on my, on my camera. Let's see if I can get this, get this worked out. So here's a, here's a molecular model of butane. And you can see, remember, the hydrogens are just these endpoints here. So we have the zigzag conformation. I'll tilt it slightly. A hydrogen coming out, a hydrogen going back, out, back, and so forth. Now, we also learned the concept of Newman projection last time. And so I want to draw this as a Newman projection and to define a, a dihedral angle here in the term. So I'm going to Newman project down the central carbon-carbon bond. So that means we're going to pick the molecule up we're going to look at it like so. Here's our Newman projection for butane in this zigzag conformation. We call this conformation an anti-conformation, or more specifically, the anti-conformer. The conformer is a conformation that lies in an energy well. So this happens to be the lowest energy conformation. Of butane. So let me show you, because it is hard doing these rotations in this three-dimensional visualization. It is hard doing it in your head. Let me give you a couple of extra tools to do this. One, of course, is we can pick up our molecular model here. 
And you can see I'm doing the projection down. This is the axis of the human projection. My finger is on it right now. And you can see the projection that we're getting. Here's the methyl on top. Remember the carbon in front of the Newman projection. You see the hydrogen is pointing in on. So in other words, I've shown these two hydrogens on the front. And then as we continue, now you see the ones on the back. And to show they're behind, we use lines going into the circle. The circle just represents the atom. I use plastic molecular models like this all the time to think about structure and conservation. I also use computer models, and I'll put one up there. So let me bounce over in a little link in the web page here. So I have a link for butane, and I'll pull up the anti conformer butane. get that so it's not down on the, on the blackboard too far. <coughs> so here's our molecule of butane, and you can see it moving to the Newman projection. We're just going to go and basically go like I had it, had it before, essentially like that. Does that make sense? So I'm just going to now rotate us into 
the anti-conformer, I've actually rotated negative 160 degrees. So let me let me see if I can rotate this, or negative 60 degrees. So let's see if I can rotate this in the other direction, a positive 60 degrees or thereabouts. So that's where we are right now, and that's our moving projection. You can do this with your plastic molecular models as well. Here's your plastic molecular model. All you have to imagine is rotating about the center bond. And we're going to see some implications here. You can see it with my plastic molecular model. Do you see how these methyl groups have now moved close to each other? You see how the methyl groups have now moved close to each other? The hydrogens, of course, we're not showing them. They have signs to them. They're about an angstrom in radius, 1.1 angstroms in radius. So they're actually banging into each other. And as a result, you have a higher energy. So I can represent that over here on the blackboard by just showing, I'll show a couple of curved lines here that show them banging into each other. We call this steric hindrance. One of the nice things with computer models is that you can go ahead and show things in various types of views. So you can see on the screen here that the two hydrogens, this one and this one, are near to each other. But you'll really see it when I make them space filling. So if I do, let's see, if I do show, okay, now you can see those hydrogens touching each other, banging into each other. Let me zoom out a little bit on the molecule here. We're way zoomed in on it, so it's a little bit bigger. And you can see the two hydrogens are touching into each other. They're banging into each other. So you pay an energetic price for that. The energetic price, we're trying to get some familiarity with energy. We talked about eclipsing HH interactions. We said in ethane, every eclipsing HH interaction in eclipsed ethane costs us a kilocalorie per mole. There are three of those, so we pay three kilocalories per mole. The price of this steric hindrance, this steric interaction in gauche butane is 0.9 kilocalories per mole. So in other words, if we said that the energy, the relative energy of the anti-conformer is zero, we're 0.9 kilocalories per mole higher in energy than anti. And I should write out the word gauche here. Where we're headed with this is we're going to get an energetic profile for what happens as we rotate all the way around the butane molecule. Now, you notice both the anti-conformer and the gauche conformer are staggered. We don't have bonds overlapping in either of those. These are both stable, low energy structures. That's why I'm calling them conformers. They're at the bottom of energy wells. But as you start to go up, it's like going skiing or something, where you ski down a hill and you get to a valley. But maybe if you go over another hill, you'll get to a deeper valley. Well, the conformers lie in the various valleys, and some valleys are higher than other valleys. But you have lots of different conformations, an infinite number of positions you can be on the slope. And so we're going to move along the slope. Here's my butane. I'm going to rotate it. If you have models, do it along with me. I'm going to rotate it until we have, great, I see some models there, until we have eclipsing of those methyl groups. Now, what do you think happens at the point that those methyl groups are eclipsed with each other? Higher in energy, a lot. They're banging right into each other.
So here's our front methyl group. And remember, we've been rotating around the back end of the molecule. Remember the trick we used in ethane? We couldn't, in our Newman projection, show things exactly overlapping, so you kind of offset it a little bit in the drawing. We're going to do exactly the same thing here. So I'm going to offset the hydrogens and the methyl group, just the hair. So this is our theta equals zero. Technically, I wouldn't call it a conformer because it's not at the bottom of a well. In fact, it's at the top of a hill. Energetically, you can't get worse than having those two methyls banging directly into each other. The energy of this is six kilocalories per mole relative to anti. Very high in energy. And these models really show it very well if you want to see just how badly those hydrogens bang into each other. I'll go back to this model here. And I'll rotate once again until we get to theta equals zero or as close as I can easily get. And you notice now you have those methyl groups essentially touching into each other. And then if I show spheres, show, you can really see them. The, uh, these cutoffs here, that's just clipping from the software. But what I want you to see, you see where my arrow is, how those hydrogens are banging into each other, and how those hydrogens are banging into each other. That really is jammed into each other. And that is severe steric hindrance that we're getting over here. What I'm going to do is to give us enough energy information to actually write an entire energetic profile for, gauche but for, for butane as we rotate about the central carbon-carbon bond. So there's one more point. We considered 180 degrees. We've considered 60 degrees. We've considered zero degrees. There's one more point that we need in order to be able to draw a sinusoidal curve that represents the energy profile. What, what would that one point be? 120 degrees, exactly. And that's going to be another energy maximum. It's not, it's not as bad as the zero degree confirmation. It's not as bad as where you have the methyls eclipsing with methyls. See, this is really bad for two reasons. This is really bad because you've got this severe steric hindrance of the methyls eclipsing, and you still have the hydrogens eclipsing with hydrogens. <coughs> Remember, hydrogens eclipsing with hydrogens cost about one kilocalorie per mole per eclipsing interaction. So I'll write out. confirmation here. So this is theta equals 120 degrees. And it's up at about 4 kilocalories per mole relative to the anti-conformer. So this gives us all the information that we need to draw out an energy profile. It also, I might add, gives us a price chart, if you will. Because now we have all the information that we actually need. We can sort of back out of here. So I mentioned before that HH eclipsing is, one kilo, is about one kilocalorie per mole. And if you think about it up there, that means that the methyl-methyl interaction in the zero degree interaction, so we'll call it methyl-methyl eclipsing, has to be four, four, four kilocalories per mole. I'll just 
write four. I'm not going to write the units, but it's kilocalories per mole. It also means here, if you think about it, since we have one HH eclipsing at one kilocalorie per mole, that we have a CH3H and another CH3H eclipsing, so that's got to be 1.5 kilocalories per mole. And finally, the only other energetic price we actually need to back out of here is we know that in gauche butane, even though there's no eclipsing, the gauche methyl is 0.9 kilocalories per mole higher.
They actually happen to be mirror images of each other. And finally, we continue up to six kilocalories per mole. Thoughts, comments? These energy curves do tell us which is the most stable conformer. So these points here represent conformers. There are three different ones. One is called gauche plus, the other is gauche minus, but most students would just refer to them as both gauche. And then here we have the anti-conformer, and that's the most stable, the lowest energy point on the curve. And these types of profiles are going to be coming back because chemists think about energies, you think about reactions, as going over a hump from reactants to products and coming to products. You've probably even seen that idea in general chemistry, right? Activation, energy. Same idea here. And in fact, rotation about a carbon-carbon bond, even in something as simple as ethane or butane, is a very simple sort of chemical reaction, where you're going from a reactant, if you will, over an energy hump to another well, a product. All right, I want to continue on now taking us to cyclohexane, and I'm going to take a moment to talk about cyclopropane and cyclobutane and cyclopentane along the way, just to bring in some of these, these energetic concepts. All right, 
so there is, let me pull down the screen for a moment. If you look down the CC bonds, what do you see with the HHs? Eclipsing. So you have the same type of eclipsing in your cyclopropane that you had in FA. In other words, you have two types of interactions here that are bad, two bad things. You have your bad bond angles, your angle strain, and you also have eclipsing interactions, and there's a fancy name for eclipsing interactions. They call it torsion strain because you have bad torsions. So I'll write eclipsing, and I'll write parenthesis torsion strain. Mute the video here. All right, so I want to give you one idea of the implications of our ring strain in cyclopropane. So cyclohexane is unstrained, and of course its formula, its empirical formula, is just twice that of cyclopropane. In other words, cyclopropane is C3H6. Cyclohexane is C6H12, so the molecular weight is twice as high. So cyclopropane is like a coiled spring. Cyclohexane is like a length of relaxed wire. Cyclopropane has twice as much energy in one quantity, one weight quantity, let's say one mole of cyclohexane as does the same amount, the same weight of cyclohexane. In other words, if I burn one mole that's 42 grams of cyclopropane, it releases 27 kilocalories per mole more heat than burning the same amount, the same weight of cyclohexane. means if I wanted a really powerful propane barbecue grill, rather than putting propane in my propane tank, I'd put in cyclopropane, because it would burn even hotter. And this principle actually goes in a lot of places. So acetylene, for example, has more strain in it, more energy in it, than, say, ethane, so when you burn acetylene, it releases more heat. And this is one reason why an oxacetylene torch <laughs> is so hot. This is used to cut steel, cut big, thick plates of steel. You just zip through it like butter with an oxacetylene torch, which is super hot and super energetic. All right, I want to talk about two more cycloalkanes and then come back to cyclohexane so that we can talk, begin talking about its conservation.
got cyclobutane, C4 rate change. So if I draw a cyclobutane, I'm drawing a square. Bond angles, the angles in a square are 90 degrees. In fact, you get a little bit of puckering of the square, just a little bit of bending out of planarity, like I'm doing with my paper here, just in order to relieve some of the torsion strain. But as a result, you have 26 kilocalories per mole of strain. It's less strained than cyclohexane, than uh, cyclopropane. So it's mainly angle strain, but also some torsion strain. Remember, angle strain is a lot worse than torsion strain. We saw in ethane that three HH eclipsing interactions only give us three kilocalories per mole. So most of that's coming from the bad angles. Okay, here's a surprising one. Cyclopentane. C5H10. You might think it's pretty unstrained. After all, the bond angles of a pentane of a pentagram, a pentagon, are just one. <laughs> okay, I had to look it up too because I'm rusty on my <laughs> uh, The bond angles of a pentagon are just a hundred or a hundred and eight degrees, virtually identical to tetrahedral, virtually identical to the 109, 109.5 degree angles that a tetrahedron wants to adopt. And yet cyclopentane has six kilocalories per mole of strain associated with it. Remember, ring strain is just the generic term we use to say a ring is strained, and then we break it down. <coughs> the main cost in cyclopentane is not the ring strain. Can I borrow your cyclohexane there? Yeah, the main, the main strain is torsion strain. We get HH eclipsing. And cyclopentane puckers a little bit to relieve some of that. It bends just a little bit to relieve some. But you still have a reasonable amount of torsion strain contributing to the ring strain. So it's mainly due all right to torsion strain. And if you want, I have, well, for time, I'm not going to pop them. I can pop them up, I guess, if the, uh, if the video projector goes on. So here's a here's a cyclo cyclopentane. I'll just move that up. Here. So okay, so if we Newman project down a bond, you really can see that H H eclipsing right over here, and then you'll see it about the other bonds. All right. Well, let us continue on now to cyclohexane. And I want to talk more about the conformations of cyclohexane because it really is very deep and it's very profound and it's very important.
invariably the way organic chemists like to represent the conformation of cyclohexane is a side on view. Cyclohexane is not a simple hexagon, it's not coplanar. The atoms go up and down and up and down. And in profile view, what this looks like is like so. And the first time, this is something you should get good at writing. And I want to point out a couple of things. Notice that this molecule is drawn as a series of parallel lines. I'm going to show you in a second how we get this profile view. Notice that this molecule is drawn as a series of parallel lines. This line and this line are parallel. This line and that line are parallel. And this line and this line are parallel. I'm going to draw it slowly again. And I'm no artist. Take a moment to do what I do. You'll probably do better than me. Notice I try to get these two lines parallel, you know, the same length. Didn't do so well on my parallel here. As I said, I'm no, no artist. And then let me continue. And there's a reasonable representation of cyclohexane. All right, let's take a look at where that comes from. You can do this a couple of ways. Maybe the most expedient way is to do it with my molecular model here. This is a projection. Let's see if I can get this on our screen. <laughs> that's, that's the projection I've just drawn. Oops, there we go. <laughs> See it? Yeah. Great. <laughs> All right, let me, let me do this with computer models as well. Of, 
Think of your cyclohexane ring as having a three-legged stool on the bottom. In other words, the three hydrogens sit, they stand vertically on a piece of paper, and three more hydrogens point vertically. You know that you've got your model right, and I see some good ones back there. I think people have been watching the David Austin video. If it stands very stably and you can put it on its legs and then put a roof on it. So let's draw in our hydrogen atoms. There's our canonical cyclohexane ring. Here are our hydrogens pointing down the legs. Here are our hydrogens pointing up. We call all of these hydrogens axial. Because they point along the vertical axis of the ring. We have three more, we have six more hydrogens. Those hydrogens point off on the side. We call these equatorial hydrogens. And you notice in representing the structure, and this comes from the projection I had on the screen of my handheld model as well as the computer model, that to draw this properly, we have parallel lines. This bond to this hydrogen is parallel to this line. The bond to this hydrogen is parallel to this line. This is also an equatorial hydrogen. All six are. Parallel, parallel, parallel. Cyclohexane is not locked into this chair conformation. And just like butane has two equivalent gauche conformations, cyclohexane without any substituents has two equivalent chair conformations. The ring can undergo a ring flip. Here's our cyclohexane. And if I pull up on this end, push down on this end, we exchange the conformers to the equivalent ring flip conformer. In this case, without substituents, identical in every way. If you want to do it with your plastic models, as I said, just pull down on one side, push up on the other side, and then make sure you have the three vertical legs, the three vertical hydrogen bonds to hydrogen pointing down, and the three pointing up. This ring flip does something very interesting, and we're going to discuss it next time as we discuss substituted cyclohexanes. Imagine for a moment that we label our hydrogens HA for the axial hydrogen at HB. As we ring flip, HB flips from being equatorial 
to be axial and AJ flips from being axial to being equatorial. So this carbon I pull off, this carbon I pull down in my model, and the ring flips. Next time we're going to discuss what happens during the ring flip, and we'll discuss the energetics of having substituents like metal rings.